Okay. All right. So fall, always kind of a back, you know, kind of a new beginning for me. I guess, you know, uh, all of us going to school, September being the, you know, the first of the year. And I thought what I might do, uh, at least for a number of weeks uh, here, is do something in just to kind of get us back in the groove before we launch into perhaps a little bit longer series. And uh, I felt led to, uh, to do something on the, the Psalms. And really, I have one, this is going to be a little different this morning, but I just have one takeaway, which is an action I'm going to ask all of you to begin. And if you do this, this will be an amazingly successful message. And, and the takeaway this morning is just this. I want you to begin to read the Psalms. All right, you got that? Read the Psalms. Some of you probably are already doing that, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And I thought to launch the series, although I'm not going to, you know, get in and teach this particular Psalm, but why don't together, um, let's together read out loud what's probably the most famous Psalm of all, and that's the 23rd Psalm. And uh, you can join me in reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though, hold on, my, there you go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a great psalm. Is that the greatest? We'll have fun when we take that apart. You know, my first exposure to the Psalms uh, was 45 years ago this November. And um, I, as most of you know, I was not um, a believer growing up. And in college, um, I probably would have identified myself as an atheist, although technically I was probably an agnostic. An atheist says they know God doesn't exist. An agnostic doubts God that exists. And so I was, you know, I just didn't have a spiritual background, and, and I'm so glad Marsha's here this morning. I was going to tell you, I was talk a little bit about Richard this morning, but um, Richard Beach, my dear friend, um, led me to Jesus Christ, and uh, I didn't know it was a relationship, I didn't really know, I had all kinds of misconceptions about what it meant to be a Christian, and, uh, and, and when God broke through and helped me understand that, that Christianity is not really a religion in the technical sense. Religion in the technical sense is man's attempt to reach God, but it's about a relationship, and, and, and Christianity is about God's attempt to reach us. And so, uh, you know, he led me to Christ, and, and I'd, I'd, I really had never read the Bible before. I had started a couple of times and never made it past a genealogy. So um, I really didn't know much. And Richard, I remember, gave me uh, a little New Testament. And I started reading it. And it was amazing because I think when Christ is in your life and the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life, uh, that book comes alive. And I just, you know, I couldn't get enough of the Bible. And uh, one day, I remember this so clearly, uh, Rich called me into his room we lived in the same house together, and uh, anyway, he called me in his room, and he had a gift for me, and he, he handed me this, this box. I think it was even wrapped, you know, and I, I unwrapped the box, and inside was a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, which is a, a study Bible filled with notes. It's, they're really, really cool, but the deal was that I didn't have the whole book. You know, my whole experience had been in the New Testament, and suddenly I had the whole book, and he challenged me. And what he challenged me to do was to start with the Psalms. And he challenged me to read five Psalms every day. And he told me that if I would do that, that uh, I would read through the book of Psalms in a month. And I began to read the Psalms. And, and it was an amazing experience, and I'll explain why as we move on here. Uh, but my challenge to you guys, by the way, is just to read one Psalm a day. Okay, just one a day. Now, if you, if you love that one so much that you just got to keep going, 
I give you my permission to keep going, but, uh, uh, but at least read one a day. And through the years, uh, what I find is, at least for me, uh, in the Psalms is where, where I connect relationally with God. Um, again, you know, th- this whole thing that we're engaged in is primarily about relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with one another, relationship with the world around us. And, and I desperately need to connect on a consistent basis with God at a relational level. And I find that that's what the Psalms do for me. They, they just seem to connect me with God in a, uh, a unique kind of a way. Uh, it's interesting. This week I was reflecting a little bit also um, about uh, statistics about Christians, both in our, you know, in our country and around the world. Uh, and, and we get these numbers. And so, for instance, Gallup says um, that 78% of all Americans identify themselves as Christians. That's down about 2% over the last seven years or something, the fastest growing group in terms of belief systems are what they call the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. I've talked a little bit about that, people that don't really believe anything, and that's now 14%. But the other thing that's real interesting to me is if you think about this, so 78% identify uh, that they're Christians, but the Pew Foundation, which also does religious research, uh, wanted to know how many of those 78% actually attend church on any kind of a regular basis. And what they discovered is that that number is about 17%. So think about this. 78% of our population uh, that identify as Christians, but only 17% that actually are part of a fellowship like this. Now, I know that going to church doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. As the old saying goes, any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. You know, uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, I, I know that it, that isn't the case, but when you look at why we come together, it, and what you miss, uh, potentially miss at least, if you're not part of a fellowship, I mean, if you're not getting fellowship, if you're not getting teaching, if you're not, you know, getting pushed into the word, if you're not praying, and yet you still identify yourself as a Christian, well, what does that even mean? I mean, you're, you're suddenly maybe a Christian intellectually, but there's, there can't, it would really be hard to have a connection with Christ without that. I mean, you know, you Christians today in, you know, certain, again, and I'm using that word not biblically, but let's use it culturally. I mean, you, there are churches and even pastors today that they don't believe Jesus died for our sins. They don't even believe sin exists. They don't certainly believe if Jesus lived that he rose from the dead. Um, they, they don't believe the scriptures or any sense of the word of God, and they don't believe there's a need for a spiritual rebirth, and yet they identify themselves as Christians. We're told that 2 billion uh, people on the earth are Christians. But again, what does that mean? Is there a real relationship there? And so for for me, and hopefully for you, the challenge is, how do we stay in relationship? And for me, again, the consistent reading of Psalms, I try to read every day. Uh, I don't always accomplish that. But again, it's a very special book. I'll give you a quick little illustration from this week. Um, re-entry was a little hard this week, and, and it wasn't the same. It's always, I think, hard coming back from vacation, but, um, but I didn't feel good. I was kind of sick, uh, and, um, and, and I was dealing with a lot of uh, kind of stressful situations, not all related to the church, but some related to the church. And, um, and by Tuesday afternoon when we had our staff meeting, I always tried to do a little devotional for our staff and also when we have our elders meeting. And, and I got to tell you, I, I was, I was, my tank was running on empty. And, and what I had done is uh, I simply took, decided I want to, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about Jesus' statement, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And I think what I proceeded to do for our poor staff was give them all these statistics on how the church is doing so badly in, you know, in the world today. And uh, I, you know, it, I'm sure it was not very inspiring uh, of a devotional. And, uh, and I was just shot, you know, and I can remember going home, and I didn't feel good, I laid down, and I had elders that night, which I always look forward to, uh, you know, Roy, you know, just, no. I really do, actually. I actually look forward to our elders' meetings because we got such great elders. But in between, 
I read my psalm for the day. Now, I cycle, I do a psalm a day based on the date. And again, if you do that, you can break the psalms into five months. And, you know, every 30 days you start a new cycle. And I happen to be in the third cycle at the moment. And it was the first of September and the psalm was Psalm 91. And, and I sat down and I began to read the psalm. And here, here's what Psalm 91 says. Um, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. Uh, I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He'll call on me and I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, let me tell you how that came across with the Holy Spirit. Here's how the emphasis was as I read that that day. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. He'll call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And that phrase, I will, I will, it was like God was speaking to me, you know, and it was kind of saying, all's well, buddy, you know, cheer up a little bit. And by the time I got to the elders, I was in a relatively upbeat mood because I connected with the Psalms. But notice when I hadn't connected in the morning, which is my normal practice, I was just off. I I was just off. So again, really, really a special book. Now, I'd like to try and help you get a little bit of a big picture this morning on the Psalms. So let me begin. um, Well, I guess I've already begun. But uh, let me begin by just saying, you know, what is a Psalm anyway? And uh, the word the psalm, we get our word psalm from, actually is rooted in a Hebrew word. And this book in the Hebrew Old Testament is titled Tehillim. And that is a word that simply means praises. Now, our word psalm comes from when the Old Testament was translated out of Hebrew and into Greek. This word Tehillim was replaced by this Greek word psalmoi. And obviously, we get our word psalm from it. And the meaning of that was songs that were sung to the accompaniment of a musical instrument. And you see, that's what the psalms were. The psalms that you read in your Bible are lyrics to songs. These are the songs that just like we sing worship together on a Sunday morning, these are the lyrics to the songs that were sung in the temple worship, uh, you know, at the time of the Old Testament. Um, Praises is is sort of the big theme uh, of the Psalms. And again, uh, the next day, uh, you know, the second, uh, Psalm 92, it really brought this out, exactly what the definition is. And in Psalm 92, the psalmist writes, sing praises to your name, to God, with the ten-string loop, with the heart lute, with the harp, and with the resounding lyre. So songs sung to the accompaniment of musical instruments, individual songs all used in worship. And what you find in the Psalms, I think, it's this heartfelt expressions of whichever writer, because David didn't write them all, uh, but whoever is writing that individual psalm, they're, they're sharing their heart you know, with God, and they're calling out to God. And so in this book, what you really have is this record of the, the spirituality uh, of the human experience. And so, uh, again, psalms, this music, and, and again, I, I was thinking this week, think about how God created us with the capacity to make music, uh, to sing. I mean, he didn't have to give us, he could have, you know, just let us be able to speak, but not have the capacity to sing. And why did he create us like that? And I think he created it because he wanted us to, to experience music and, and that the primary reason for that was worship, was worship. And again, I've, I've really felt for many years, and, and I think that this piece sometimes gets... Um, doesn't get the acknowledgement it needs to, but but really, I think the highest use of the mental capacities that we've been created with, and really what I think our most important job is in life, is to worship God, is to worship God. And long before David, by the way, 
the people of God in the Old Testament were using music to worship God. For instance, picture this. Remember the Exodus, all right? And uh, let me see. I think I have a a Charlton Heston picture here from the Exodus. Okay, so so think about the Exodus for a minute. You know, you you, you have the whole experience of Israel being in slavery. Uh, God unleashes these plagues with the final plague being the Passover. And and rapidly, rapidly, the, the nation of Israel leaves Egypt. And remember, as they get to the Red Sea, remember there's a mountain on the right, there's a mountain on the left, there's the Red Sea in front, and all of a sudden they look back and Pharaoh has changed his mind. And so Pharaoh has come, and he's pursuing, uh, you know, the army of Egypt is pursuing the Israelites. And, of course, this is where God does this miracle, opens the Red Sea. The scriptures even use the word that he congeals the water to, to, to hold it in place. And, of course, the Israelites cross through. And then as Pharaoh and his army arrive and begin to pursue them, God closes the congealed waters. And, and imagine, again, you're, you're an Israelite and you're standing and you're watching this and you're seeing the entire Egyptian army drowned as that water comes back on and you're standing on the shore. What's your first response to that going to be? You know what Israel's first response was? They sang. They sang. And here's what we're told. So, again, let me go back for one second here. I'm having a little problem with my... Uh, Power, my keynote this morning it's has a mind of its own so again so here's the these are the last this is the next to the last verse in exodus 14 that day the lord saved israel from the hands of the egyptians and israel saw the egyptians lying dead on the shore and then here's the very first verse of the next chapter then moses and the israelites sang and, and what they're singing is a is a psalm basically they sang this song to the lord i'll sing to the lord for he's highly exalted. The horse and the rider or driver, he's hurled into the sea. And, and it goes on, and a little bit later after they sung it, then it says, Then Miriam, the prophet Aaron's sister, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, so she got a tambourine, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. Both the horse and the rider, he's hurled into the sea. Now, you can go throughout the Old Testament, and of course, ultimately, where we most know uh, the book of Psalms being rooted in is that when God first gave the tabernacle and then the temple, that, that in the temple, uh, David, who was a musician, you know, and again, he writes half of the Psalms, roughly, he writes at least 73. There's a whole bunch of the Psalms that aren't give, we aren't given who the author is. Some of those might have been David, but we, for 73 are at least identified. But, but this became just at the heart of the worship of, of Israel. And uh, even uh, whole categories of the tribe of Levi were assigned, and their job was to lead the music of the worship there in the tabernacle. Uh, but it went on. So it, you get to the second temple period, the time of Jesus. And by that point in time, these 150 sets of lyrics were fixed. Uh, actually, by 250 B.C., when the Septuagint was put together, th they had compiled and probably done earlier than this, honestly. But think about it. These, these, were, these were lyrics, probably each of them written on a little scroll individually. But they became compiled together, and, and whether there were more than these that were used, we really don't know, but we know these are the ones that God picked, and that's why they're like his greatest hits, 150 of these songs, and, but, but Jesus, this, these would have been the songs that Jesus sang. You know, as a young boy growing up in the synagogue, they would have been singing these songs. And then the early church music became such a part of the early church, and they actually began to write new music. And the newer music we call hymns, and hymns are basically psalms, I mean, songs to the accompaniment of musical instruments. And then, you know, uh, it was part of the new wineskin uh, of the early church. And we know that they did this because we're told in Acts chapter 16, when Paul gets thrown in jail, what is it that he's doing? He's singing hymns, you know, that night. So music was a part of the early church. And then when Paul writes the book of Ephesians, he says that when we are filled with the Spirit, there's a series of things that should happen, but one of the outcomes of that is that we should sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
And so again, these are songs of worship, lyrics to these great songs expressing, uh, just expressing, you know, the, the heart, the heart's response to God. Now, there are a number of different kind of psalms, and I want to just expose you to these this morning. And uh, Biff, why don't you come up with me, because I'm, I'm going to use Biff for this. When you read the psalms, one of the things is sometimes they tell you exactly what it's about. There's a little introduction. So sometimes it'll say something like, Psalm 3 says this, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So if you go back into the history of Israel, and you know what's happening there, and then you read, and this is... This is David's expression uh, to him. Sometimes it even tells us specifically uh, the kind of musical instrument. And there's Hebrew words here that nobody really quite knows exactly what they are, but one paraphrase of Psalm 4 says that, that the introduction to it says, for the choir director on stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Psalm 5, for the choir director with flute accompaniment. Okay, so, so there were all these different things, but, but really, like most music... Um, really the Psalms span the entire range of human emotion. And I'm going to tell you this morning the five main categories of Psalms, and you'll probably, as you begin reading them, you'll begin to see which uh, that it falls into. Uh, probably the most predominant kind of Psalms are Psalms of praise or of adoration or of thanksgiving. And and as I was thinking about this, I thought, okay, what do you do when you're feeling good? You know, when things are going great, you ought to praise the Lord. You ought to sing a song, okay? And, and I don't know which, what, what, what psalm, should we do like 103, Psalm 103, we sing this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with me. You know, also, you might think of these as almost like love songs. Do you know the, the little chorus, I love you, Lord, lift my voice? Do you, can you, you think you can do that just, in, you know, off the cuff? We haven't rehearsed this, by the way. We are so good. No, just kidding. Anyway, okay, yeah. Biff is so good. Okay, yeah, okay. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice. All right, so psalms of worship, and of course, much of what we do on Sunday morning is that, that our music really expresses love for God um, and, uh, and worship and praise and adoration. So that's, that's maybe you might think of it as the main kind of psalm or song you're going to run into there. Hey, come on up by me, Biff. All right, all right, all right. All right. Now, second kind of psalm, and I think this is really important, is that one of the categories of psalms are called psalms of lament or psalms of complaint. So we sing to the Lord when we're feeling up, but in the, in the book of Psalms, the psalmist sang to the Lord when he was feeling down. And I think about the psalms of lament, and again, they express this fact sometimes that the psalmist is depressed and he is down, it's like the Jewish blues. And, and I, taught, I, ta I, I taught one time, you might remember, I taught one time on Psalm 42. It will be one of the psalms I'll teach on again. And Biff wrote a song for it. So give us a little bit of the blues. Yeah, yeah, all right, blues, baby, all right, yeah, they were wishing that they had Biff as one of the sons of Korah, all right, anyway, you know, it's interesting to me, um, David is a melancholy personality, you, you can't read the Psalms of the Bible without realizing this was a guy that struggled with the ups and downs of life, I, I'm a melancholy, so I really identify with him, and I've had a struggle Really, I think all my life with depression, I don't even think I identified it till I was an adult, but I can remember hitting Psalm 42 and thinking, well, thank you, Lord. You know, somebody else 
you know, this is part of the human experience. And then I began, and I forgot to go back and count this, but I began to just make notes in my Bible on, on one page of every time in the Psalms it talked about either being down or poor and needy. That's one of David's big ones. Sometimes even despair. And I think I've got 80 texts or references to when the psalmist, see, God can handle this. You know, he, he doesn't just want us to put on a happy face. I mean, sometimes we struggle. And when, you know, when you're down, sing the blues, baby. And, and when you think of it, most of our early gospel music really came out of the slave trade and, and living in that kind of an oppressive climate. And, and the way that that got expressed was by singing. And so we have these great, great, great gospel songs. So Psalms of Complaint. Uh, third type of psalm is uh, what we simply would call uh, psalms of confession. The theologians refer to these as the penitential uh, psalms. And the classic, I think, is Psalm 51. I will do this as one of our Sundays because this, this is the song that David writes. Remember, he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And instead of dealing with it and getting honest with that sin, he turns around and orchestrates the murder of her husband, Uriah the Hittite, and he covers that up. But God reveals to the prophet Nathan what David's done. And Nathan comes and confronts him. And it's a great passage there in the Old Testament when you read about it. And David gets honest. And he confesses his sin and he repents. And he writes this psalm, Psalm 51. Do we have anything on that? Okay. A clean heart, O oh God, and renew thy spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew thy spirit within me. So we sing to God when things are going good. We sing to God when things are going bad. We sing to him when we blow it, you know. And, and I love the opening line of Psalm 51 is, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And so again, this, this great expression and experience of, of even when we fail, you know, that we can come to God and pour out our hearts and he is forgiving. Uh, fourth kind of psalm. Uh, and I'm jumping ahead here. I'm going to save the best for last. Huh? Fourth kind of psalm are, are called messianic psalms. And oftentimes in the psalms you will find uh, prophetic messages about the coming of Christ. Psalm 22, uh, if you go back and read Psalm 22, it gives a vivid description of crucifixion a thousand years before the Romans invented it. I mean, you, you, they did, David didn't even know what he was writing part of the time, but it's messianic. It talks about the crucifixion of Christ. Psalm 45, messianic, it talks about the king, you know, Christ coming as king. And then the one I love, Psalm 110, but I don't know what you've got. You got something that's kind of messianic there? Okay. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Yeah, all right, that's a little messianic. Psalm 110, great psalm. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, the writer of Hebrews quotes that to show the deity of Christ. David says, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, what's going on there? You know, it's messianic about the fact that the one that was coming would not simply, you know, be the Messiah, but he'd be the Son of God, God the Son, really. So messianic, uh, another kind. By the way, I got to say this. Have any of you heard that Jesus is coming again on the 13th of September? Th this is going around. And uh, I mean, I'm not making fun of this because I always usually every year, uh, right before the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, Jesus kept fulfilling the feast. So he was crucified 
Passover, uh, Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. The third major feast that hadn't been fulfilled is Tabernacles, which many theologians believe will happen, uh, that the second coming of Christ will happen at the time of Tabernacles. Usually takes place in late September, early October, and so I usually always tell you, be good, you know, be good, right, you know, keep, keep an eye out. But the 13th is, uh, the 13th, 14th and 15th, actually, I think, this year is the Feast of Trumpets. And again, if you happen to believe that the Lord's going to take the church out of the world, you know, prior to the coming of Christ in what's called the rapture, then a lot of people will identify that uh, with the trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets. And so because of the blood red moons, there's a lot of reasons why. So all I'm saying is, the, the guy was saying, why aren't pastors telling their churches that Jesus is coming again on September 13th? So I just like to say Jesus might come again on September 13th, or the 12th, or the 11th, or the 20th, or this afternoon, or tomorrow. So anyway, but uh, Messianic. So I've, I, I've warned you, because that's next, next Sunday, and it would be great if Jesus came again next Sunday, all right? Finally, fifth category, and we, you know, Biff and I have had a little fun with this. Uh, we'll do both things, okay? So, and that is that some of the Psalms are, they're angry. They are called uh, imprecatory Psalms. And what they are, it's like, okay, you, you, you sing a song when things are going good. You sing a song when you're depressed. You sing a song about the coming, you know, of the Lord coming back. And sometimes when you're just mad at somebody, mad at somebody you, you sing a song and in the psalms david is both mad at his enemies but he's mad at god sometimes and, and the psalms express this kind of like lord where are you you know you used to show up all the time where are you now and, and one of the great psalms and again biff wrote a song about this is that one of the psalms was written um, during the exile Psalm 137 isn't written by David. It's, it's written when Israel's been taken into exile in Babylon, and, and they're in Babylon, and music must be so much a part of who they are that their captors, the Babylonians, come to them and say, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And I'll let Biff do this a little. He wrote a song about this. Sing me a song. Now, I have to tell you this, and this, and Biff and I are going to do one more little thing together here, but, but picture this, and, and what the psalm says is this, so uh, by the rivers, the rivers of Babylon, our captors there, you know, ask, uh, we hung up our harps, is the first thing it says, so, you know, they, had, they played harps, and, they, and then they say, come sing us one of these songs, and the final piece of the song, imprecatory, you know, the psalmist says this, happy is the one that smashes your babies on the rocks. And here's how Biff and I think that should go. We'll hang headbang. Smash your babies on the rock. Smash your babies on the rock. All right. Imprecatory. Imprecatory. Okay. So anyway, you know, it might not sound very Christian, you know, but uh, it's just, you know, sometimes you're really angry, you know. And David, you'll see a lot of his um, psalms. He writes about his enemies and asking God, you know, you know, take them out, Lord. You know, so again... Th- all kinds of things. And, uh, and the, the, the main message of the imprecatory psalms is this. Help. Help me. Help me. Thanks, Biff. Yeah. We should do this more often. This kind of fun. All right. So we'll wrap it up. Um, so again, the, uh, the main message of this morning is simply this. Read the psalms. And, and just to kind of close it up again, let's remember that it's all about a relationship with Jesus. And so that's why we want to read the Psalms. Jesus will meet us as we spend time there. It, the Psalm, that, that it'll keep it real. You know, you, you know, if you're down, you can express that to God. If you're up, you can express that. If you're mad, you can express it. But it keeps the relationship real. And I think the challenge 
for all of us always in our spiritual lives is to stay in relationship and God has given us this tool uh, the book of Psalms and so we will begin to uh, make our way through the best of the best Uh, I haven't decided exactly how many weeks when I told Lee Larson that I was doing Psalms he got this pale look on his face thinking there's a hundred and fifty of them and he spent three and a half years just going through 12 chapters so anyway uh, what I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick some of my favorites kind of the best of the best and uh, so we'll spend a, some time together here in these early days in the fall of, uh, of really connecting with God as we uh, study the Psalms together so let's pray Father, we thank you today for your love for us. And Lord, you know, it's so easy for us to drift in our relationship with you. It's easy for us to drift in our relationships with each other. And and we need help, Lord. We need to have that consistency of spending time with you. And Lord, thank you. Uh, Thank you for these lyrics, these songs that so express the... uh, you know, the, just the, the, the crying out of the human heart and the, and the longing, the longing to know you better. And Lord, I pray that you would bless uh, everyone in this room that as they begin to read the Psalms, that it would give them just a, a fresh uh, renewal in their walk with you, Christ. And, uh, and just refresh Highline, Lord. Make this just a great time for all of us together too. And we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Can we all stand? 